Hello and welcome to Northeast Christian Church online service. We are so happy to have you with us. Please be sure to follow NECC on all social media platforms. And to listen to all our past messages, follow us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. Thank you and enjoy the rest of the service. the opportunity to share a message with you again today. Uh, I hope you learned from last week's sermon, and uh, I hope you do the same today. Uh, For those of you who might be joining us for the first time, or perhaps the first time in a long time, as you heard, I'm Pastor Dylan. I'm one of the pastors on staff here, and we're making our way through a series we do every January on what's called the Spiritual Disciplines. Uh, These are things that Jesus taught us to do in his Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapters 5 through 7. We call this series Practicing the Way after a book released just this week from a pastor named John Mark Comer. Uh, I'm deeply indebted to him for shaping my own understanding of spiritual practices, of spiritual formation. Uh, I highly encourage you to pick up his book. His resources will be a tremendous help to you in your own spiritual walk. It'll be a benefit. I really hope that you do that. Uh, Last week, we covered the spiritual practice of prayer, and today we're going to cover the spiritual practice of fasting. Um, As important as solid doctrinal beliefs are, I don't think it's any accident that Jesus taught his disciples what to do before he taught them why they were doing it. Very often, I find that we as Christians can mentally agree with things, and not really do much with it. Uh, I'm not saying that people who do that are fake Christians. We all have room to grow, but our objective in this series in this church is that we would be more devoted followers of Jesus. Uh, The Sermon on the Mount shows us that Jesus is concerned with your formation more than your education. Uh, James Jesus' little brother, in James chapter 2, verse 19 and 20, said it this way, you believe that God is one. That's a Jewish doctrinal statement, by the way. That's from uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6, called the Shema, which is the most famous uh, doctrinal statement and prayer of the Jewish faith. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord our God is one. That's what he's saying. You believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless. Doctrine is eternally important. But unless we show we really believe it by our actions, it remains like an appliance not plugged into the wall. It's useless. St. Augustine said it this way, without God, we cannot. Without us, God will not. That's why we practice spiritual practices. If you turn to Matthew chapter 6, Jesus begins his lesson on these practices by saying this in verse 1. Beware of practicing your righteousness before others in order to be seen for them, for then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. We talked about the danger of performance last week, but I want you to underline or highlight or circle or whatever you do in your Bible that little phrase, practicing your righteousness. That's what Jesus' sermon is all about. What does it mean to receive the word and then live it out? What does it mean to practice righteousness? That's the question the Sermon on the Mount is answering. And to show us what it looks like to be an apprentice of Christ, to live in a new way, that's why we're talking about it today, because these practices train us to do that. Now, don't buy the line that you can just do good things and doctrine doesn't matter, right? Uh, Jesus teaches a lot of doctrine, in fact, and so does the New Testament. But neither can we lay claim to the name Christian if we're not coupling our beliefs with good works. Both are necessary. But if you're going to start with one or the other, I would start with good practice. Because right belief will come if you humble yourself enough to do these things. 
But if you wait until you have every T crossed and every I dotted and you have your head completely around Christianity and you've answered every question, you might just find following Jesus becomes really difficult because he has to form us before he educates us. That's the prerequisite to understanding in the kingdom of God. Today we're going to move to the second practice Jesus teaches us in his Sermon on the Mount, fasting. Uh, let me just say from the outset that I know for some of you this could be especially triggering if you struggle with body image issues or with various eating disorders. And I want you to know that as a church family, we're sensitive to you, and we would ask that you not abstain from food, but we could work with you to abstain from other things. We could even work with your therapist if you want that, if you have that and would like that. We're here for you, and we know that this can be a difficult and sensitive topic, especially in our day. But we talk about it because it was important to Jesus and he knew the complicated relationship between humans and food better than we do. So, learning to be controlled and wise is something that we're going to aspire toward this morning, but we're not always perfect at. And so I hope you give me grace and us grace as we talk about a difficult topic together. In order to learn about fasting, we're going to let Jesus' words speak for themselves, and you can find those in Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 16. We'll go to verse 18. It's just three short verses today. Everybody say hallelujah. <laughs> um, but we're going to use other parts of the Bible and history for context to understand fasting a little bit better. But we're going to focus on these three verses and hopefully let Jesus speak for himself. All right, so it's going to be in Matthew chapter 6. We'll start in verse 16. Now you can follow along on the screens if you'd like. You can listen to me. Uh, also, if you have a Bible version you prefer, I highly recommend you download the YouVersion Bible app. It helps me engage with the scriptures more often. It will give you daily notifications. It will help you be consistent with your scripture reading. You can listen to it while you do other activities as well, like drive or wash the dishes or do laundry. It, you will engage the Bible more often if you download that. It's the primary way that I do, and I hope you take advantage of it. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 16. Start, or excuse me, Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse, six, verse 16 through 18. Let's read that together. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they love to disfigure their faces that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But, I, but when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. This is God's word. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you've given us a guide. I pray that you would give us the strength, the, the discipline, the grace that we need to become the people that you're shaping us into. Lord, I pray that today that you would hide just one of your servants behind the cross and that you would teach us how to live the crucified life. And we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, the first time I ever fasted from food was in Bible college. Uh, I arrived there a fairly new Christian, and I didn't know much about Christianity, but I was eager to jump in. Uh, and when I heard about the heroic actions of some other students and them fasting for long periods of time, I said to myself, I'm going to try this out. Uh, what could go wrong, right? <laughs> and I, I decided I was going to fast for three days, and I successfully made it. It was a rewarding experience, uh, but I didn't really have any guidance on how this stuff works uh, because no one ever taught me. And so after the fast was done, I was so hungry, I wolfed down an entire large cheese pizza to myself. Now, it, I wouldn't recommend breaking your fast that way, just some hard-won uh, experience, some unsolicited advice. I found that, in short order, uh, eating a lot of cheese is a very poor way to reintroduce food to your body. Um, and it happens to be doubly bad if you're lactose intolerant, but I will spare you the details, and everyone can thank me for that later. But I'd venture to say that I'm not the only one who's kind of lost here, because we've never really had training on this. 
In the United States, it's something we don't really think about. In fact, fasting, for the most part, is either viewed as something only the extremely holy people do, or it's considered to be borderline cult behavior by large parts of American society. Uh, in his book, Practicing the Way, Pastor John Mark Coburn describes fasting as arguably the single most neglected practice in the modern Western church. Uh, as I said to you guys last week, our society has trained us to uh, endeavor for things, to strive for things, to do things, but we're not so good at stopping and ceasing and abstaining from things. Uh, Self-denial is seen as self-hatred and cultic at worst, and often foolish at best. And yet Jesus assumes that you're going to do it. In fact, he not only permits fasting, but he encourages it here. And this is just a sidebar, by the way. Jesus will challenge things about your culture that are off. Okay, whether you're white bread American like me, or whether you're from Ghana, or the Dominican Republic, or Puerto Rico, Brazil, Cambodia, India, whatever, fill in the blank, we all have areas that God will challenge us to grow in. Uh, in the West, we've neglected this practice for a long time. We're more likely to hear about fasting than some Instagram health influencer than we are from a Christian. I once heard about, I'm not kidding, look this up, a breathitarian on Instagram. It's ridiculous. But, you know, we're more likely to hear that kind of stuff or about intermittent, intermittent, uh, I can't say that word this morning, apparently, fasting than we are about the spiritual practice of fasting we find in the New Testament. But for us, fasting is not about changing the shape of our body. It's about forming our soul. And to do that, we need to practice how to fast and abstain, not just from food. It will certainly include food if you're medically able, but from many, many other things as well. Let's take a look at Jesus' instruction to us in verse 16. He says, And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. Uh, just like in prayer, a disciple or an apprentice, if you want to use that word, of Jesus, truly learns to fast by fasting in secret. Everybody's shocked by that, I know, after last week. Uh, but you'll find that all true spiritual practices find their momentum in the secret place. In your private life is where it all starts. Jesus tells his disciples not to make a show of this practice. But what Jesus doesn't tell his disciples here is why do we fast? Or even what is fasting? Uh, he's speaking to a set of Jewish believers who would have been really familiar with the Old Testament and so he doesn't explain things tailored in a way for us to understand in the 21st century. You'll find that's true about a lot of the Bible. So he doesn't really need to explain the why behind fasting. Instead, he just tells them how they should fast. But for us, you and I need both the why and the how because we're not as familiar with this. Uh, you might be justified in asking the question, uh, if if God is my father, like I heard last week, and he knows what I need before I ask him, why do I need to fast or abstain from anything in order for him to hear me anyway? One Protestant church reformer went so far as to call fasting an unnecessary discipline. Au contraire, mon frere. I strongly disagree, and so does Jesus, by the way. He puts it in his big three. So, in order to understand fasting, we're going to ask three questions with the scriptures this morning. Number one, what is fasting? Number two, why should we fast? And number three, how should we fast? All right, number one, what is it? Number two, why should we even do it? And number three, how do we do it? Does that make sense? So, before we unpack the why and the how, it helps to begin by asking, what is fasting first? Now, I was a Christian for years before anyone explained this to me, uh, and for those of you who do know, it's a good reminder. Uh, fasting is the intentional abstaining from food or pastime used to provide escape, comfort, pleasure, or relief. That's from Chris Hodges. Uh, he's a pastor in Alabama the, of the third largest church in America. He wrote a great book recently called Pray First that goes over prayer and fasting. That's another great one for you to pick up. Fasting doesn't necessarily mean 
that you totally abstain from food and water all at once. Uh, for some of you, that's a really bad idea. I have friends in here who need to eat food with medication to keep them alive. I have other friends who struggle with eating disorders. But if you can fast from food without risk to your health, you should. Because we too easily do what's comfortable for us, and then you miss the whole point of fasting. You can certainly fast other things, but try food. And as you intentionally abstain from food or other things that bring you pleasure, you'll find that you're more attuned to God. Mar Martin Luther, the man who started the Protestant Reformation, said, fasting and bodily preparation are indeed fine outward training, but he is a true faster who fasts with his whole body. Now, what does that mean? It means fasting can and should include other things that you're abstaining from rather than food. Sometimes fasting might look like abstaining from sitting on the couch at the end of the day and using your body to serve others. Do we have anybody who wants to raise a hand there? Uh, to volunteer, to go to a church event, to, to go to a meeting that might not be of great benefit to you, but you could serve somebody else. It might look like fasting TV and spending your evening hours with your kid or your spouse. It might look like fasting social media and video games and other entertainment so you can spend your time on God and other people. Whatever you fast, you are called to fast. It's not optional for apprentices of Christ. And it begins the work of turning our hearts away from seeking our own pleasure. It's the ability to look at something you want and say no. But it's about more than self-control. It's about turning away from pleasure in order to turn toward God and other people. That's the goal of fasting. You empty yourself of something in order to fill yourself with something else. And ironically, there are plenty of people who stop eating and never really start fasting. That's what Isaiah the prophet says in Isaiah chapter 58, verses 3 and 4. He says, Behold, in the day of your fast, you seek your own pleasure and oppress all your workers. You fast only to quarrel, to fight, to hit with a wicked fist. Fasting like yours this day will not make your voice to be heard on high. Fasting is about turning away from seeking what's only for our good, and as we turn towards others, we find that our hearts will turn toward God. But if we lose sight of others, of love when we're fasting, then our spiritual activity risks degenerating into a private, self-help, therapeutic spirituality that's only about us. That's not why we fast. Probably one of the hardest things for me to abstain from when I was younger was video games. Now, there's nothing wrong with video games. They're perfectly fine on their own, but for me, they became an obsession. I mean, I would easily lose self-control. I remember days in high school uh, where I'd wait for my parents to leave and go to work, and by this time I could drive myself. Uh, I would play video games for like eight or nine hours straight. World of Warcraft was my, uh, the poison I picked. I know it's awful and terrible and nerdy, but that was my deal. You, you remember those like phones that they had where they would read the message out loud, like the house phone, uh, when somebody would leave a message? I would go down there, yeah, answering machine, thank you, forgot the word. <laughs> Thank you, Alicia. Uh, I, I, would, I would go downstairs, I would delete the answering machine's message, I would cover my track, you know. Uh, the school would send a letter to say, your son has like 14 absences, and I would be able to throw that letter away, you know, uh, get the mail. Uh, it was an obsession for me. It took over my life. For others of us, maybe you seek pleasure by shopping. You spend way too much money on yourself and hardly enough on anybody else. And you can find reasons to excuse it, to justify it, when in reality we're feeding our flesh rather than subduing it. Others of you hide behind the label introvert. Now there's nothing wrong with being an introvert. God made every single one of you differently. That's a good thing. But sometimes we use excuses of personality to hoard our time just like we would something else. And you can hide there forever if you want to. You can justify yourself, but there's a fine line between wisdom and selfishness, and usually we're the last ones to notice we've crossed it. And yes, 
Some of you comfort yourself with food. It, it may not be lots of food. It may not be on a clinical level. It just might be that you eat out constantly, squandering the resources that God has given you. Now, I've been there. I know that way too well. I have single-handedly made Chipotle a wealthy corporation. Uh, they owe me a lifetime supply at this point. There's something particular about restraining the stomach that our minds and hearts rebel against and find an excuse not to do. That's why the Bible puts such an emphasis on it. If you're able to do this, and you're emotionally grounded in this area, you should. We all have areas that we use for self-comfort, and Jesus is telling us, if you intentionally choose to forego those things, you will be met with a reward from God. So number one, what is fasting? It's the intentional abstaining from any food or pastime used to provide escape, comfort, pleasure, or relief. I hope that helps you. No one ever just gave me a solid definition. Uh, I hope that that uh, helps you avoid some of the pitfalls that I had. Uh, try just fasting one meal, a uh, one meal a week and devote that time to prayer or call somebody else and pray them, uh, pray with them. Next week, maybe try two meals on one day and do the same thing and uh, take it slow. Just be patient with yourself, but I'd highly recommend ending your fast with oatmeal and not pizza as well. Um, but Jesus promises us that if we do this in secret, we will meet with God. And what an amazing promise that is. That is worth it to me. Your father delights to see your sincerity. And fasting is a way to show him that. It's like what Isaiah said in chapter 58, to make your voice heard on high. Number two, why do we fast? Shouldn't God know your heart? Why do you have to do anything to show him your sincerity? Why do we need to do any of this to begin with? Those are all great questions. Uh, as I quoted earlier, St. Augustine, I love him. He's got a brilliant mind. In one of his sermons, he says this, do you, do you wish your prayer to fly toward God? Give it two wings, fasting and almsgiving. Now, almsgiving is just another word for generosity, which we'll cover later in this series. Uh, but these are really two sides of the same coin. Uh, our prayers take flight when we give something up, whether it's food or money or time, or service to someone, your prayers take off when you do that. And we don't always understand precisely why. Listen, fasting is a mystical practice, but the Bible does outline some things. Fasting helps you seek God's wisdom, seek divine protection. It helps you grieve and mourn. It helps you repent of your sins and turn back to God. Those are just to name a few. One of my favorite stories in the Old Testament is when Jonah the prophet goes to the city of Nineveh, and he said, God is going to judge you for your sins in 40 days. And to his surprise, they actually believe him. In Jonah chapter 3, verse 5, it says, And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast, put on sackcloth, from the greatest of them to the least of them. It goes on to say that even the king himself fasts for three days, and even the cows are forced to fast for three days. Poor little heifers. So that's one of my favorite stories. Uh, and God turns away from his judgment. Uh, fasting, in this case, was about expressing sorrow for the evil things they did. That's one reason for you to fast. If you've been trapped by a sin, fasting will not suddenly take away the desires. I'm not going to sell you a lie. But it will bring your body and heart into alignment with God's will. Uh, we live in a day of full-blown worship of sensuality on display everywhere. People would react violently against any suggestion that there are pleasures or impulses of the body that we should deny. And this isn't just for young people, by the way. I hope whether you're young or old, uh, whether you're struggling with various forms of identity or whether you're in a midlife crisis and thinking about giving up your wife, let me, let me say this really clearly here. Your desires do not equal your identity. Your desires do not equal your identity. I have plenty of desires that I need to fight. And that's a critique I have of many, not just ideologies, but behaviors I see out there from Christians to other people. But as Christ's apprentice, 
you are to use your body differently than those who are around you. Fasting is when we say with our bodies, God, I belong to you. I will not be a slave of my desires. It's one of the primary ways that you train yourself in holiness. Why do we fast? One big reason, in our time, in our day, to consecrate, to dedicate our bodies to the Lord. It's a way of saying yes to God, not just with your mouth, not just with your mind, but with your stomach. Jesus doesn't ask you to attend a conference on this, to read a book on this, to, to listen to a podcast on this. He wants a devotion that goes beyond mere mental platitudes into our very bodies. That's why we do things like this. That's why we engage in this practice that goes beyond mere intellect to fight the ingrained tendencies within us. There is a reciprocal relationship between your commitment to these disciplines and your power in the Spirit. And we hate to admit that, because then it puts a large portion of responsibility on us for our spiritual growth. All my Reformed folks got real quiet there. Now you could summarize the why of fasting by saying we fast to starve the flesh and feed the Spirit. And I don't mean by that your physical body. Listen to me, your body is good, it's not bad. When the Bible talks about fighting the flesh, it's talking about that spiritual evil in our hearts that's called the flesh. If you feed it, it grows, but if you starve it, it loses power. Now, uh, some of you I know, you know what I mean when I say this. When you sin, you want more, and you want more, and you want more, and it takes over your life. Fasting helps you alter your spiritual palate. It changes what you desire. Both in the Garden of Eden and in the desert temptation of Christ, you have a temptation that involves food. Why? I don't think that's an accident. There's a relationship there. Because this reciprocal relationship between our discipline with food and our discipline with sin is put on display over and over and over again. Uh, Thomas Akempis, in his famous book, The Imitation of Christ, said... Restrain from gluttony, and thou shalt the more easily restrain from all the inclinations of the flesh. The less restraint we have with our appetites, the less restraint and self-control we tend to have in all areas of our life, whether it's sex, or shopping, or gossip, or anger, fill in the blank. But when you begin fasting, You'll find that your desire for sin doesn't ma magically vanish, but they do diminish, and more importantly, your desire for God multiplies. For those of you who struggle and you can't fast food, you can de develop this spiritual muscle in other ways. God sees your struggle because your Father is with you in secret. You are not alone. You are not defective. God knows your struggle and will help you build this muscle in other ways. Uh, my favorite figure in American church history is uh, John Wesley. Uh, I heard this quoted in a sermon the other day. It was amazing. I love him so much. The name Wesley is on the short list for baby names for Monica and I. Also, last week, I made a dad joke, and a bunch of people asked if we're pregnant. All right, Monica and I are not pregnant. Everybody just go ahead, open up your purse, take out a chill pill, and pop it. It just never... Ha it never hurts to have a baby name list, just to be prepared, all right? Anyway, uh, John Wesley, who founded the uh, Methodist and Wesleyan branches of Christianity, uh, he said this, I fear there are now thousands of Methodists, so-called, both in England and Ireland, who follow the same bad example and have entirely left off fasting so that they do not fast even twice in a month. All right, everybody, avert your eyes, lower your gaze, with every head bowed and every eye closed. All right? Now, I know this is hard to admit, but it brings us to number three, how should we fast? Uh, it was common for the first 1,500 years of church history, uh, right up until the Enlightenment, for Christians to regularly fast. Uh, the earliest Christian document outside the New Testament, by the way, is called the Didache, 
Uh, it's a collection of writings on the practices of the church. Uh, you should read it. Uh, the Didache says this, Let not your fasts be with the hypocrites, for they fast on Tuesdays and Thursdays, but you shall fast on Wednesdays and Fridays. Now, that's a reference to the Pharisees who fasted on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and early Christians were like, no, we want our own days. I mean, people have been arguing about minor points of religion since the beginning of time, and it's kind of funny and petty, but the point still stands. Uh, early Christians aimed to fast twice a week. Now, this is the part where you can all sink down into your seats if you want to and feel real bad, less than, and unholy, but that's not my aim, and that's not God's either. Right? He knows you ate a cheesesteak last Wednesday. It's going to be all right. Uh, I'm not trying to shame you into legalism or make the claim that only the really serious Christians fast. But I was a Christian for close to three years before anybody explained this stuff to me. And it wasn't because I was obsessed with food. It, it wasn't because I wasn't a committed believer that I didn't do this. It's just that I just didn't know. Can you imagine what God would start to do in your life if you made this just a once-a-week practice? or just one meal a week. Imagine the peace that he would start to give you in those quiet moments that you lacked. Imagine what God might do in your marriage or in your family if you started to do this together. Imagine what God would do right here in our church if we took seriously this practice and fasted together. How God might begin to pour out his blessing and his power and his spirit and his grace through us while we love one another, we'd be able to be a light to the world. Imagine what he's capable of if we would take him seriously at his word. Why should we fast? How should we fast? Here's a helpful reminder. Excuse me. There's a book called Atomic Habits by James Clear, who's a researcher on habits. And he tells us to focus first on small improvements. Now, if you try fasting for a whole day right now and you've never done it before, you're probably going to get really mad, you're going to stop, you're going to think you're a bad Christian, you're going to quit, and you're going to end up binging on McDonald's chicken nuggets or something, all right? Uh, but start small. Maybe on Monday you start with just breakfast fasting, and you pray during that time. Maybe you fast lunch instead, and you pray during that time. You start with small steps, and God helps you with the big ones. And every time you miss a meal, you sit down and you pray and ask God to be with you. Uh, Jesus knew his disciples would need guidance on this. That's why he says in verse 17 and 18, but when you fast, anoint your head, wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Basically, he's saying, uh, don't appear disheveled in order to get noticed. Do what you're going to do. Take care of what you normally would. And then your fasting becomes a private offering to God rather than a spectacle for other people. If food is something you can't abstain from, that's okay. You can abstain from other things. We all can. In fact, I would encourage all of you to abstain from maybe one or two meals a week. Try that. And then abstain from Netflix. You know you've been watching it way too much. You have time to reclaim and dedicate to God and others. I'm going to call the worship team back at this time. Uh, for those of you who might be new to fasting, and maybe you just want to learn more, uh, I would encourage you to join our class Practicing the Way, which meets every Sunday morning from 9 to 10 a.m. Now, we've been meeting in the back. We were completely overflowing this morning. We had way too many people. Next week, we're going to meet in the children's area upstairs. If you show up at 9 a.m. and you want to join us for that, We'll be covering fasting in much more depth soon. Listen, it can be overwhelming at first. How many of you have ever felt overwhelmed by church and what, you know, you end up doing here, right? It's, it can be pretty intense, and we can get in the cycle of judging ourselves, but God isn't aiming to shame you with this. In fact, he tells people not even to tell other people when they're fasting. <laughs> so I'm not going to know. I'm not going to be checking up on your fasting sheet, but I've shared my practices with you here this morning because I think they could be helpful. But no one's going to know either way. Uh, when, what we see in the scriptures is that when we take a small step towards God, just like the story of the prodigal son, God runs towards us. I mean, we, if, we, if God sees that first step of sincerity, he starts to see a potential for growth in our hearts. You might feel like you can barely limp towards him. 
but God will run after you. That's how God always works. He doesn't squash people with only a small amount of faith. He's never done that. In fact, one of my favorite verses in the Bible is in the Old Testament, also in Isaiah. It's chapter 42, verse 3. It says this about the Messiah. A bruised reed he will not break, and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. When you hear about these things, you might feel like your wick is barely burning. You've got no oil left. You might feel bruised and beat up like you can barely stand up like a reed. But Isaiah tells us that when the Messiah comes, he's going to be gentle. These practices are not a way for you to earn God's favor. The Messiah is gentle, and so he gives us these practices as a gift because they're what help us grow. They make us into the kind of people he wants us to become. And so if you find yourself, for whatever reason, stuck in a sin or afraid to come to God, fasting isn't something only the holy people are allowed to do. In fact, it's often what the people who feel the farthest from God do when they want to get back to him. And so I hope that you practice that this week, that you begin that practice of fasting in your own life. And we're here with you. We're here to work with you. And so I'm going to invite you to stand. And as you do, as you seek the Lord here in this one last worship song, I pray that you'd open your heart up to the idea that maybe God would meet you not in the place of doing more, of achieving more, of adding more to your schedule, but maybe God would meet you in the place where you carve out something that was there like a meal and say, God, I'm here for you. And you will see growth this year if you choose to do that. God bless you. Thank you for being with us today. Be sure to listen to all our messages on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify. And follow us on ne-cc.org for all information and updates. Thank you. God bless. Have a great day.